yeah first of all i just want to say a massive thank you to to you guys to renee and, and michael for um for being so up for this for being up for having a conversation and um yeah i anticipate that this is going to be challenging that it's going to be difficult for you as well as for as for me and for many others watching and um just want to give the full permission first of all for honesty for um for you guys to be as honest as you feel able to be um and to be, of course be as as full of grace as you as you feel able to be um but also for you to know that um yeah this is a, a space for for you to to share and to be heard um and yeah and also just to, to state right at the, at the beginning of this that um you know that i recognize and we recognize how difficult this this time has been and not because it is a time in isolation but because it is it's part of a bigger picture and, and part of what we're going to talk about today i think is some of your own experiences of, of what that has looked like for you in your life um but also zooming out a little bit and how has that felt in a church context or in or even in the uk uh, as a whole um yeah i rate you guys really highly really have enjoyed getting to know you over the last few years and um just thank you thank you for being here so i guess what we could do to start off with was a couple of introductions um i think most people in open heaven really know who you are but just to be clear for anyone who's watching do you want to say uh who you are um i don't know why you came to loughborough or what you're up to at the moment what's your life stage something like that renee why don't you kick us off sure um so yeah i'm renee um i well, came to Loughborough to study sports science um, and I'm graduating, or well, technically I finish being a good like, student next week, which Jeez. is mad. Um, and then I'll be here for three more years, which was not intended, but oh. we move. Right? <laughs> we move. Um, and yes, I'll be working next year. Amazing. And I am Michael, otherwise known as my street name, Big Mac, on Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, I study civil engineering, but I'm currently on placement, actually. Um, and Rich finishes in about six weeks' time, two months' time. Um, and I've got two more years here in Loughborough. Uh, so here for a long time, already. got a five-year course, so you ain't getting rid of me that quickly. Absolutely delighted with that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're so lucky. Shout out Hayley Bailey with the sports science. It's honestly fantastic. Whoa, where, where are my civil engineers at? <laughs> what? Yeah, that interaction going early on. Scandalous. Lots of love in the comments already. We've had lots more people joined. Um, Haley, John, um, Malachi's in, locked in, in fact. We've, we've got some <clears throat> Christina as well. Anyway, um, let's just start off with you know a very current situation a situation that in many ways has brought a lot of these discussions out in the open even though they've been happening probably behind the scenes in loads of different ways um the death of george floyd the killing of george floyd and um i think it's obviously provoked a national a global kind of out outcry in a way about about issues of race and race relations and particularly obviously police brutality and and then broadening that into structural racism institutional racism and things like that first of all how how did you guys i don't know how did you feel how have you felt in the aftermath of what you've seen and what it has brought up in you i think it'd be great to hear that uh, mike if you're up for going first that'd be amazing yeah um yeah no it's been hard it's been really hard um i remember when i first i can't remember when, when, I, when I first saw the, saw the video i think it was about i think it was maybe the same night it happened um I only, I think I got like five, five, five or 10 seconds in and I was just like, it's just, it's just too much to even, yeah, it's just, it's too much to even like watch just at once. And like, it's too much to watch at all, but yeah, yeah, then like seeing someone who look, looks exactly like me, yeah, obviously he's a bit older, but seeing somebody who looks exactly like me doing something that I'd probably do, just go to a shop, I'm not saying that I might use a counterfeit note or whatever they said apparently it was. But I would just me as I would go go to the shop as he was doing, and then to just see that is like a direct aftermath of just another innocent black man just living his normal life, doing what all of us are in the world just do and do on a free basis, and see him like killed like that was yeah it was it, it, it was hard to watch. Not not even just because it was like another black man dying, but just like the deeper the deeper issue behind what happened, um, and the. The, the deeper sig significance it has for like 
just just all, all of our lives, especially as black people as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just hard. I haven't been able to like word my true emotions really by it because I've still been trying to. I've been I've wrote on my notes so many times trying to print it to come story up about how I feel, but I just couldn't even find the words to really explain it. But I felt really sad. I felt angry. I felt frustrated and just brought up loads of like my own experiences. And it seemed like everything that I've gone through in my whole life, that was just like a microcosm of that. And like, just like the most violent way of the racing that probably a lot of us have faced um, in a, like, um, in a, in, in like an obvious way that everyone can watch. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, personally for me, it was really hard. Um, and I, it literally took me like 10 attempts to even get through five minutes of the video. Cause every time I just like broke down. So yeah. 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 I think before I think I share how I like responded to the murder of George Floyd, I think it's important for me to say that when Michael and I speak and we share experiences, I think it's, it's from our experience. So we can't speak for every black person, like every yeah. black person's experience is going to be super different to ours. Mm-hmm. Um, and saying that as well is obviously I'm a black woman, Michael's a black man. And so there's an element of where we'll be talking from an experience of black people um, rather than just like, we can't, I don't feel comfortable just speaking on uh, the Asian experience or the Hispanic experience, because that's not something that I personally have, I guess that's not where my experience lies. Um, So yeah, just kind of pre-warning info. That's really helpful. Ask questions. That's really helpful because the the black experience is, is really diverse. You know, black yeah, isn't just sure. one homogenous group, is it? There is a whole range and there's so much diversity within that. So mm. it's really help- helpful to clarify that. Thank you. Um, but in terms of when I saw, if I'm completely honest, when I first saw um, a little video and a little bit, a snippet of the murder of George Floyd, I was not shocked. Like it just kind of was, it was like, I think I just thought, oh, again. Um, and I just kind of went back to do my work. I think I sent it to a group chat um, and I just moved on. Um, and then I got a message from one of my close friends, like capital letters, like what is going on? What's happening? And then I rewatched the video and I kind of thought about what I was seeing and what was in front of me. And I just remember, like, I just broke down. Um, and I just, I literally just remember like crying and just being like, why? Um, and suddenly it hit me that like George Floyd could have been, my dad it could have been my cousin and then I started thinking what if that was Michael what if that was Malachi and some of my best friends and just the thought of like potentially losing some of my best friends because of their skin color was like really really hard um and something that I've just throughout the week has just hit me at different points and I'll literally just cry or I'll just be angry or I'll just be filled with this like sense of like I want to do something I want to help I want I can't stay silent anymore um so yeah, it was just a massive, when I first saw it, I thought, I just thought, okay. Um, yeah. But then as I thought about it more, I was like, oh, actually, n- like this is the fourth, fifth major thing in lockdown at that yeah. week that we've seen. Mm. Um, so I was like, I can't stay quiet on this anymore. So it was just, yeah, sadness and probably a bit of like anger. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know how to response to that I feel like I, I could totally understand why you feel that and the sense of closeness to it I think there's some reactions that people can have in the UK is like that's an American problem or you know we you know we don't really see that over here you know you guys know uh, I know that's not strictly true and whilst we don't know maybe have some of the as well we certainly not have as many high profile killings in the same way the black mm-hmm. experience in the UK is also one which is full of challenges and like you know situations of fear against authority and and police and um you know i I was saying the other day about um you know we mentioned we had a conversation beforehand about um mike you you mentioned stephen lawrence and like i remember um the report into his into his death the mcpherson report came out in 99 i think which is when i started senior school high school and I remember it being like really significant and like studying it yeah. and learning about it. But you were saying a lot of people don't even know, a lot of like particularly <coughs> white people don't even know who Stephen Lawrence is in the UK at the moment, particularly younger people. Like, yeah. The real UK experience. There was a report last year into higher education, racial discrimination at higher education level. There's been loads of stuff, but 
this is a UK thing. And like, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about, I suppose, first of all, racism in the UK, um, institutional racism, but then also your personal experience. I, I don't know where you want to start, but that feels like a good place to kind of go. Um, I feel like... I don't go forward. It's, sorry, Mike. <laughs> no, no I, was, um, I was going to say you go first. <laughs> I, knew you, I knew you were. I knew you were. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I think I explained this in small group last night. And I think the best way to explain it to Christians um, is like, so often as a Christian, we, we're going to be like persecuted for our faith. And often when you enter spaces where there's just no Christians, you're very aware to the fact that you are the only Christian in the room. And you're very conscious of what you do and what you say. And you're like, for example, you'd be like, should I drink? Uh, but if I drink, they may think that that's just going against, I don't know, the Bible, for example. Or if I don't drink, they'll make a joke about me being this super holy Christian. Or they'll be, make comments and jokes about, oh, you go to church on a Sunday. You're just very aware of what you say. And you're like, I want to show Jesus. But then I also don't want to feel uncomfortable. And there's all these kind of conflicting thoughts that happen at exactly the same time. Um, and it's the same experience for being a black person in, a major in majority white spaces. Um, as you're aware of, I'm aware that I'm black and I'm aware that I go to a predominantly white uni. I'm aware that I attend a predominantly white church. And so when you enter those spaces, um, I remember in, in Freshers, I was very aware of it. I was like, uh, I'm going to smile a bit more so people don't think I'm an aggressive black woman, which is the normal narrative. Um, I might change my tone of voice slightly so I don't sound like I'm from the ghetto or I don't sound like I'm, um, I just, I don't feel the stereotypes and you have all these questions. And another thing is the sense of, uh, a, a big thing I think for black women or for myself is the hair thing and a lot of people want to know about your hair and they, they ask can I touch your hair or can I feel it how does it get like this and you get all these questions and as a black woman you're like no I don't really want you to touch my hair but then at the same time you're like I don't want to challenge it because it makes me look aggressive and it makes me look too forthcoming confrontational, whereas, yeah. yeah confrontational so you then step back and you just let things happen um, and I think that's the best way to like to explain um I guess my experience in terms of like an analogy or yeah kind of vibe yeah yeah no that's yeah that's like so so it's really like especially I think for me especially like pre-uni um because I for you don't know I, don't, I, I live in southeast Kent which is and the area I live in I think the year I came the census uh for my area I think it was what was it like 90 I think it was 90 like seven percent white and like one point seven percent black and then one percent like everyone else and um that was like evident in my school because like, my whole school year everybody was white I was the only black person and there was stuff that so I've I've always been used to being on the outside and uh, stuff that when I look back some of the like comments people made to me growing up I think about it now I think like that was just like not okay but then when stuff like that happened especially when you feel that you're, like you're the only one it's hard to like say anything because you're sort of scared to speak up because if you speak up it's like oh, I, oh why, why are you being sensitive oh, I, it was just making a joke I'm like oh I, I, I wasn't trying to be racist and like just like really small comments which I think they I truly believe that they don't really think it's like a like a race thing they think it's just a joke or they think um there's having like bands like between friends but they don't understand that like you wouldn't say this to somebody who was the exact same as me, but who looked white. So therefore it is a race thing. And therefore it makes it a lot harder to um, like take stuff like that. Whether it's, gosh, I even, so I, I was, I wrote down like those examples about stuff been like said to me personally at school and like even reading it, it's just, yeah. So like stuff from say, um, from the range of like, oh, I'm, I'm more black than you don't act black. Um, your nose is so flat and wide. Like, oh, is, is, is that what all black people think? Like, oh, do you do you speak your language? And they start making like all those noises, um, like assuming that oh, I listen to grime because I'm black. Assuming because I'll be really fast because I'm black. Don't get me wrong, I do listen to grime, and I wouldn't say I'm fast, but I'm alright. But just like the 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 assumptions like made in the first place, or like oh, you do you don't sound black, 
or try and pronounce like all my names when like and I'm not trying to say that oh you should get my name right first time or even fifth time because my names are hard to say even I struggle with them but if I've said to you this is how you pronounce it and you keep trying and you start saying oh is it Oli and just like that's obviously not what I said so like just stop trying because it sort of becomes defensive then when you just when they because like they know they don't know how to say it but then they keep saying it just basically tell you oh your name does your name so weird but if they actually ask me oh what do your names actually mean they realize the name means like God is just like God has shown me God has shown me mercy. God has bestowed his favor upon me. Like these aren't weird names. Like these names mean maybe more than you, your name even meant. But then just because it, because, because you're not used to it, it looks like, oh, it's a weird name. Um, so I think that's sort of like, I think it's the comments that I've received um, just throughout my years, which I think the ones that hit me the most, because those are the ones where like, you don't under- you don't really understand why it offends you in a racial aspect unless you're black. And mm-hmm. Like it's, it's it's a hard thing to accept, but um, it's something that I think, especially growing up in like Ken, I think I'd had to be soft heart to everything um, because if I didn't, then everyone probably wouldn't have liked me if I spoke up for every single time something happened to me. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not saying I should have been quiet. And I really, I wish I had more com- confidence back then when I was younger to say something. But it's hard when you like feel alone, and it's something that like nobody understands. And like there was a case where. I think I was in year 11, so I was 16. So I like, was, we weren't even, we were kids, we weren't actually kids. Um, and someone said to me, he made a comment to tell me to go back to my own country. And we were like halfway through a match at, at lunchtime, we, we, we were playing football. And I, and I was just like, and this wasn't even one of my mates, it's just a random kid got a bit annoyed at me, he told him to go back to my own country. Um, so, so we were in the football game, so he had the ball. I, I just, Foul, let's say I, I fouled him it wasn't even that hard it was just like a no those tackles you just like you you, you you get the ball but you get the man as well I didn't leave like a little bit. Leave a little yeah bit yeah there. you know what I'm saying <laughs> you know what I'm saying I didn't hit him I didn't punch him or anything I just fouled him anyway he runs into school he's he's crying so much oh I miss Mike, Michael Vincent beat me up la 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 and then I, I get called into school and then oh Mike this, this is very unlike you're not one to be aggressive and la 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 and then long story short I got excluded for a day for being violent he didn't he decided to skip school next day because you were scared had Easter break for the next two weeks and that's the last I heard of it so the last day the reaction I got from my whole school was oh Michael you're, you're getting excluded for being aggressive and nothing was not even about like t- turning the boy off no one even asked no one even realised the deepness of it they just thought it was like another oh um, Michael you're, you, you look this way or like you have big feet or like you're ugly you're not funny like this always like an insult rather than like like a racist remark and I think that's the hard thing to, that's why it makes it hard sometimes to explain how you really feel to people that aren't black because you feel like they will just see it as like another insult rather than actually like mm. a, a like a racial comment um mm. but yeah that's like me at school i feel like for me listening to michael's thing there is it like i feel like for a lot of people there's a sense of like oh my goodness michael that's so sad and that's like pretty awful um and like for me it's like an added additional thought of like one day god willing if i have children and if i have a son i was saying in small group my son will either be fully black or half white black sorry that's that's just genetics um and it's like i don't really feel comfortable knowing that my son could go to school and receive comments or daughter could receive comments like michael or myself have received through over the years and it's like, I think that's why this, I guess, the Black Lives Matter movement is, I guess, important for all of us because it's like creating another generation where things will be better, um, God willing. And I think for me, I've had an opposite experience to Michael in the sense of I've grown up in South London. So super diverse, super, um, I've in- been able to interact with loads of different people from different ethnic minority backgrounds and or even just even white British people. Um, so when I came to uni, it was a shock. It was like, oh my goodness, I'm actually one of very little. Um, and it was like, I struggled because I felt this sense of, I guess, it, imposter syndrome. I felt like I'm here, but should I be here? Should I be interacting with these people? Um, I never felt that people saw me for me. Um, I always felt like I had to adapt because if I showed who I was, it was it was not going to be uh, I guess liked and I think as a fresher you want to find you want to be comfortable and you want mm. I guess to find family and to find friends um, and it just it makes it difficult and I think a uni not not a think but a uni was the first time I've ever experienced overt racism 
um, which is I, I used to play in a, a particular sport and there was a social and um, we basically had to share a story. And from that story, people would you'd get a name written on your head. Um, and I stood up to share my story. And before I spoke, somebody was like, wait, 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 has someone got a white pen? Um, to basically uh, say that a black pen wouldn't show up on my skin, um, which is just uh, nonsense, to be fair. But that was the first time that I've ever experienced a comment and telling my family, telling my mum, I know that really, like, it hurt her because obviously we're so far away from, from her. Um, my grandma was like, I don't know, like my granddad was beaten up in the past and she was like, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to be in danger. And so it's just like, it's a reality of, of what we live with on the day to day. And in the sense of the covert comments and the, the comments that are made from particular racial biases do make it really difficult and they do make it hard because you want to respond, but you also don't know how um, and how, how you call it out kind of thing. Mm. It's so hard hearing those stories, you know, when I say sorry, I don't know, it's not, it's not enough, is it? I'm so sorry that you've had to go through that and that you still do. And I think one of the challenges that, that we've heard, again, comparing the American story to the UK, um, I was speaking to a friend the other day and he was saying racism in the UK is, is as strong, but it's more British. So it's maybe not always the um, outspoken comments. It's not always the stuff that you've said, but it's always it's also uh, implied or implicit or structural or systemic. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. So I mentioned earlier the, the Stephen Lawrence situation and, and the report that went into that, which revealed institutional racism within the police force, which was a huge, huge thing. And, it's, and I mean, I, I don't know how the police is now, I, but I know that, there are, I know some good police officers. That's what I do know. That's obviously it was a huge report. Um, what what has that felt like in terms of being in a situation or a country where there is also the unspoken or the implied um, racism? Like, how has that felt for you? you? You've talked about probably examples of comments, but I imagine, and from hearing experiences of of you guys and other people that I've spoken to, that so much more of it is even like the iceberg under the water stuff. Is that yeah. fair to say or? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think, I think it's like how Ren was saying earlier about the feeling when, you know, so, so like, for example, I remember in my, in my gap year, I worked for like a, like, like a law firm. Um, and we, we had like a Kent Law Society dinner and at, this, at least probably there was more people than goes like the, like, a, like a normal, like, OH1 service, so probably about like 100, 200 people. And like, no one there was black apart from me. Everybody was like a white male. There's probably like 30 wh white ladies. Then like, I was like the bum black boy. And like, it's hard to even put into words, but when you're, when you're, especially in the professional space, when you're the only one in that whole space that like looks at like yourself, you feel this pressure of like, I need to make sure I speak even more like a certain way and you make sure I eat even more and even make sure I'm um I'm not super loud because like because I'm that's not saying oh all the people that look at me and think oh this guy is this but there's something just inbuilt into our like the, the way we are brought up like as as, as like black people you, you mentioned the Steve S Stephen Lawrence case like I don't know any black person myself especially if you're born in London who you weren't raised with, like Stephen Lawrence being like the, like the foundation that you're raised about race upon. So like everyone knew as a kid, even if you're six years old, you, you know the name. You may not understand the story, but you know the name. And ev everyone like, we, well, we, we, we like expect stuff like this to happen. And it's sad that we do, but like it's expected. But I think for like the op opposite side, for like a lot, a lot of my white friends that I know, they don't, they weren't ever brought up knowing the stories of, Black people being hard done by police. People wouldn't even, probably wouldn't even know his his name until probably like the past two weeks, and that's why it makes going to something like like Kent or Society you know, where I was like the only black person, where you 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 can sort of like feel like the looks and the the glare sometimes you get from certain people, and they to them they may not they may not seem like his friends, but like you know that behind that look, it's not just oh hi, it's like oh you oh. And then you already, without even realizing, you form like a judgment on who you expect me to be. So therefore, when I when 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 I speak well, they're like, oh yeah, you you, you speak you, you speak really well for a black person. And it's like, what's that supposed to mean? 
or like I remember one time my sister was asked, she works, she's a doctor. She was asked by someone, where do you learn how to speak English? And so if that shows that their initial assumption is that, oh, because you're black, you, I expect you to be loud. So therefore, if you're loud, and I see you being really loud and loudly and aggressive. Oh, I'm not surprised. But if but if you're actually quite calm and quite um, peaceful, oh, this is weird. You're are, 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 aren't you supposed to be really loud and bubbly? And why are you being so quiet? And it's stuff like that which they're, they're not even saying anything. But you just feel you, you, you just you just feel a bit of a shift. Like when when I'm saying, like when you're like the only Christian going to like a non-Christian room or like a place where there aren't many people who believe the same as you, just naturally feel a bit of a oh, like is everyone going to look at me? Everyone's going to every action I do now they may depict the whole of the black race based on how they act because apparently all black people are the same. So if I act a certain way, their view on all black people now is going to be based on that one thing I said, one thing I do. So even for like job, uh, like a job interview for my placement ones, go to like a, um, go to one of the, before, um, when I got interviewed at Laffa, for example, um, for my placement, the people, the people that came for my placement, there were like, I think six white interviewers, not one person black, not one person female, just six white males. And it's like, okay naturally you're just like okay and let me make sure i do this and do that not to say i'm not saying they're racist i'm not saying they think oh he's not gonna get the job but it's just the same way our foundations were built upon people like stephen lawrence and stories like him the same way that for a lot of white people they weren't built on those foundations therefore their assumptions are based from deeper 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 rooted issues that goes back to hundreds of years ago which they may not think that they're it has anything to do with them but it's in it's in their race it's in who they are so is when we start to accept that looks like systemic systematic racism is a thing and it's what a lot of the people in this country are brought, brought up upon that's when like we'll start to see change um mm -hmm. but yeah that's just a bit of my own experience i feel like yeah. for me personally i was always it sounds harsh what i'm going to say but it, i guess it's just the reality of it is i was always raised and told that i need to work twice as hard to get half as much as my white counterparts um and just the sense of like I always have to make that extra effort to just be seen um and seen for who I actually am and again like I said it seems really harsh but in a world where in, in a country even where the leadership or the, if you look to the government it is uh, it's white British if you look to organizations often the leadership is, is, is white British um, even if we look to kind of church often church leadership is predominantly white British and so it's just a sense of like if you want to like, I don't know it's just always how I was raised and you got kind of um, in order to I guess because of the institutionalized racism structures are already made against black people if that makes sense they're not eight they're not um there to aid black people but they're, they're kind of structured against them so to even kind of to to do what you want to do you kind of got to work that a little bit harder um so that's probably how i yeah i've just always been that's how i've always been raised and it's not a nice way to to grow up and it's it's not nice but it's just the reality of it again um yeah. Yeah. The, the reality is that most of the systems and structures that we're living in have, were built by white people. Exactly. You know, um, James Corden said in his kind of address the other day, um, why are we expecting black people to change systems they didn't create? Or like, it's, a, it's not just an, an issue for black people to address. And one of the things that often gets overlooked in the UK is our colonial history and the empire. The reason that Britain has such a strong standing in the world <laughs> affair is because of an empire and the Commonwealth, we know about the Commonwealth, don't we, Mike? The wealth ain't common, man. <laughs> <laughs> the wealth ain't common in the Commonwealth. <laughs> Michael, 2019. But a lot of the, like, the American sort of slavery, the slave trade, you know, a lot of that was rooted in the British colonial history. Um, and, you know, so what happens then when uh, a country like like Britain, which is obviously majority, majority of you white, if they build almost a society, the sort of post-industrial revolution, when they have... They have the power and the ability to set all the the things that you know how do you then live in that system and then the systems that come out of that are then replicas of that almost they are biased towards a certain group of people and i think that the, yeah, a lot of british people are maybe unaware of that history at times or at least not as or certainly ashamed of it i'd say but some people don't know tons about it and like i went to school um obviously in in england I learned about Nazi Germany for genuinely like six years of my school year. Like yeah. <laughs> never once, never once learned about the British Empire. 
never mm. once learned about the slave trade or anything like that. Um, yeah. And I think there is, you know, are, are we educated? Are we informed? Do we know what's going on? And I think that's my next kind of question to you guys is about education um, and ignorance. So a lot of the stuff that I've heard, say like Raheem Sterling say, it's like, it's just, just ignorance. There's lack of education. So you have the example yeah. in England, England played in Eastern Europe and, in Eastern Europe, there tends to be some really bad examples of racism towards black footballers. And, and there's obviously yeah. some really high profile cases. And he's talked about, about ignorance and education. I think there's obviously, there's another thing missing, which I think we'll come on to, but what, what does, what needs to happen in terms of education? Like, what is it that people are missing in that sense? If that's what we're talking about. It's a good question. Good um, question. I'd say just like a small example from like where, where I grew up. Um, so when my first, so I used to live in South East London until I was 10 and ev every single, every single year, whenever it was black, black history month, we always did like a big old, just everything that month was just all about black history from the good to the bad, to the hard, to the stuff that's hard to read and to take. Um, but then when I moved to Kent, not once through year six to year 13 was Black History even mentioned as like a, I know, I'm not saying, oh, I need to talk, talk about black people for a month, but at least if it's just the one month where most most people are like, oh, you know what, if you don't care about black people for 11 months, at least we're going to talk about them for like the month we're going to speak about them. But in my whole time, uh, in, in all my schools, not once was Black History Month even mentioned as like a thing. And I think, I think it makes it hard from both sides because actually black people in Kent, if if that's the case, you sort of like not not forget who you are, but it's easy sometimes when you're not surrounded by anyone that is like that looks like you or acts like you or has the same like cultural upbringing as you. And when you're never spoken about it at school, which is where you spend most of your time, it's easy to sort of like lose sight of like like who you really really are and like where you're really really from. And I think for the, for for the, the white people in comparison to that, I think for them, like they they just don't know. And it's not like a lot of my friends, for example, a lot of my friends just don't know. And it's not their fault that they don't know. It's the education that they've been brought up with. It's the upbringing they've had. But I, 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 I don't know from a teaching perspective about how much you can speak about like certain stuff or how it, it may make the, the, our precious British Empire look bad. Or if you speak about in history, or it's all well and good to blast the Germans, but we can't blast ourselves. And like, I don't know how it works like in terms of to get into the education system but I know that it just has to be has to be spoken about and if school is a place you're going to be at the most school is a place where, where it should like it should happen and, and even even at home as well but I guess that that's all another argument because some mums and dads like may not have the same view about like black people and ethnic minorities as you do so at least their parents are going to do it. at least if school even brought it up and like I remember the amount of times I come to in like into school, uh, I remember in year six when I first joined. Now people that did that thought Africa was a country and stuff, stuff like that. Like it's just like, but but they genuinely thought Africa was a country. They just didn't know. And it's, for us, it sounds stupid, but for them, it's like they just genuinely just did not know because no one's telling them. So, and if you're not gonna, there's not a million black people in Kent. So the black people are gonna say it to them. The white people have to. So, yeah, I don't know. I just think even if it's just doing proper thing about black history month at schools that that's like a start in the right direction because most schools do it but i know a lot of schools don't so yeah i feel like <clears throat> in terms of the looking at it through school education i think yes it does need to be we need to see more of it in the curriculum and yes we need to see more of um just a kind of the truth of british history and a part of british history is is colonialism and and slavery and that needs to be a bit more intertwined into the curriculum in short um but i kind of want to take it a different outtake in terms of education and i was talking about this in a small group yesterday and i think we we obviously all need to educate ourselves but i think the best way to do that is through actually journeying with people and doing life with other people. Um, I know, for example, so my best friend, Abby Coburn, shout out Abby Coburn. Her mum's watching this, so shout out Liz. Um, I, I think after we've been friends for a while and through our friendship, I've been able to debunk racial biases that she's had and she's been able to debunk racial biases that I've had. And that's the only way that I think we can continue 
educating each other outside of school because I know there's going to be adults in the workplace that are watching this now and wondering how how can I educate myself and I think it's just it's doing life with each other and I guess looking around at your social circle and asking the question of how diverse is my social circle you know um who's in my social circle how can I learn a bit more about this experience and, and their experiences so I think journeying with people is a is a really massive massive thing yeah I, wanna, yeah, I want to pick that up because like, when I said education, I didn't necessarily just mean institutions, but I understand that's kind of the example I gave and Malachi makes a great point um, about that in the, in the comments. Because um, the next point I was coming on to is, is education in terms of learning, like we all have to learn, we have to do the reading and the research, but but also empathy. And that not doesn't that doesn't mean sympathy, which is patronizing and potentially mm-hmm. just like, oh, bless you. But actually walking alongside people, journeying, hearing stories, that's the education that I think is probably missing at times. And th- there's so much fear of people getting stuff wrong and saying stuff wrong that I think they almost stand off. But like to have genuine like conversations with people that are walking alongside you, wanting to understand your experience and your life and like just listen. I don't know. That feels to me like educational. You know, that's what a lot of people are missing that the reality like the the, the the big element of racism is the dehumanization of it and like the sense of like depersonalizing it so it almost just becomes about a color rather than about actual people who have actual lives yeah. and stories mm-hmm. whereas when you like walk with people you you can't see it like that or you shouldn't be able to you're actually dealing with humans and with with stories and complexities and i mean you've you kind of mentioned that a little bit but like have you I don't know what really to ask off the back of that, but like, how do we get, how do we get more of that education, more of that, like journeying along? Like, I, maybe this is part of it, like being able to facilitate yeah, conversations, but it has to be more personal than this. You know what I mean? Like it has to be, cause I don't want to just, I don't want this to be a conversation between us three with 40 people watching. Like what about everybody in our community? Like how do we build that um, empathy and understanding and listening? Yeah. Hmm. I think it is just, I think, looking around and seeing who you're normally connecting with and if that is a predominant uh, race or ethnicity and then challenging that. So challenging why you only connect with certain people or challenging um, how you can actually connect with other people. Um, And then I think the sense of empathy comes from listening and actually trying to like take into account what what somebody's saying to you. Um, and why they're saying it and where it comes from um, and then act, and then acting upon it and I think that's again the difference between sympathy and empathy is a sense that empathy comes with like an act it comes with like a I, I want to help but how can I how can I help with this um, and I think for example when myself and Abby have had conversations I know that we have conversations and then it, talk about it whatever and then for her there's a sense of empathy so if somebody is going to make a racist comment or a racist remark there's a sense of like no actually this isn't this isn't okay like this is Mm. not okay and vice versa for me if somebody makes a statement that I think is um like uh, I guess prejudiced to to white British I'm like no actually that's not true and that's not accurate um Mm. and then you you want you need to say something (coughs) and you want to change really yeah yeah no that's so true yeah no like complete Tim's what they said like yeah, yeah you know it, it, it just starts with those those especially like if if you have black friends I'm sure everyone I'm, I'm sure I'm friends with friends with you. I'm sure between the two of us we can cover the 40 people who are watching this now I'm sure I'm sure all of us are friends with them at least um but like it, yeah it, it just starts as like just speaking speak to your black friends and understand like their experiences I feel like like obviously we've seen a big social media like um just like wave going on with like black like there's now and I've seen different like Instagram trends and stuff like that that's been going on but like I think because I remember speaking to Hope and she was saying that like Instagram's really good like spreading spreading like a message and like and spend the message far but it's, it's it's easy to sort of feel like distant from it when it's not really somebody you know or you can like relate to on a personal level because you'll see like a really inspiring speech from someone you're like yeah that's that's what that really it really touched me but then after that it doesn't really do anything else apart from that at the moment you you feel like wow but then when you actually have do life with like one of your friends that's different because then like i'm sure i'm sure a lot of my friends probably didn't know some of the stuff i've said has happened to me because because we haven't spoken about it and i'm sure if they had known that that would have started their learning about it so much earlier than just seeing somebody die 
um like yeah. in 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 america um so and like um malik i made a really good video about when you get comfortable being uncomfortable and that's like so true because it's like it's a very uncomfortable conversation to have from like both sides like for like for for me it's scary because i'm just like i don't want to offend you but also this is like my truth like even doing this i was shook i was so scared <laughs> because like this is something that's so real for me but i know it will make people feel uncomfortable hearing these stories but at the same time it's like it, need, it needs to happen or the conversation are gonna uh, are they're, they're not gonna be had because yeah. you just have to you have to just have to know that it's not an easy topic it's not a sense of you can't choose when like black lives matter like this is like for a whole population of people this is like our like re- reality like it's not just it's not just like a it's just a trend it's, it's our everyday life and yeah. if you really want to like get on board and understand and learn it comes from doing life together but also being being like super real with doing that and not just choosing when you want to listen or choosing what you want to hear mm-hmm. or being like no i'm a walk with you and like if i say something wrong call me out on it and like i want to learn i want to if you experience something please like let l- let me know um mm-hmm. and i think it's stuff like that which actually show i think stuff like that is what's going to cause change because i think people react more when it's with somebody they know or then they can relate to rather than just mm-hmm. like some of they see on social media um yeah I, feel, I agree and um, as well as I think on I feel like this time I, I have a mass I have a sense of like a like a spiritual shift it feels different it feels like I don't know if it's just a social media like present I don't know what it is but it feels like people I know within for black people everyone's like you know what, I'm gonna speak up now and I'm gonna speak out and 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 share the experiences and I think from from a white British side it's like a I want to listen and I'm I'm ready to hear and I'm ready to, I'm ready to kind of engage in a conversation and it feels I don't know there's just a massive sense of like a shift and like a change and I think a big part of that is the sense of on this occasion we did see a lot of ch- churches especially the mega churches in the yeah. US speaking out about it and I feel like I, I remember Ness saying in one of her talks like if we want to see revival like the church needs to speak out about things and I feel like this is an example of that, of where the church has spoken out and there's been a shift, there's been conversation. Um, and I'm, it's my prayer that it just doesn't die out um, and it doesn't just become a trend of 2020. It was not something that in um, a year's time we look back and we're like, oh, do you remember when we were all talking about race or racism and, and it just yeah. dies? Um, but instead it's something that we can like actually learn from and grow and continue um, educating ourselves on it. Um, mm. And I keep seeing everywhere, it's the thing is, it's, it's not about white versus black, but it's about racist versus anti-racist. And I think it's a good argument. And it, I think by doing that is it removes the, segre- the racial segregation and mm. instead focuses it on the, the argument and it focuses on the sense of we're trying to get rid of race, racism and deconstruct racial biases. Um, but yes, I'm excited really, basically. That's awesome. Shout out to Malachi as well. It was an amazing video that, that he did. Um, yeah. He's a great, great guy. Yeah, I feel like some of the um, optimism that I feel about the future as well is that the generation who will go on to be the leaders in society in the next 10, 20, 30 years will hopefully be people that have grown up with these mm-hmm. things now and it, it will be part of it. And I think a big challenge that a lot of people have, you know, you talked about speak to your black friends like a lot of people might not have black friends like a lot of white people in the UK might not have grown up in diverse contexts and like don't know how to make those friendships or like I I think there's a there's a challenge that like the UK now is obviously way more diverse than it was decades ago let's say um and like that to me I mean obviously I don't want to start making statements about political things but I feel like that's a really positive like I, I'm a fan of diversity and multiculturalism where I feel like there's the opportunity for people to genuinely like journey together, to live together. And, and that's where empathy grows. And then I think, you know, leaders that are going to be coming up in the next 10, 20, 30 years will be people for whom that was their reality and their normality, as opposed to like people who grew up with barely any diversity, like, you know, in their lives. Mm-hmm. Like even for me, like when I grew up in my secondary school, there were two black kids in my year at school. I think there were two, there were two black kids in like, probably over half of the school in my year and above, and they were twins. Like, it wasn't until I moved to London, before I, I, li- I lived in London for a year before I came to uni, that was where I really, like, experienced all of this and learned so much about, like, like living in a diverse place and, and sometimes even being the minority, like, myself, like, actually 
walking with people listening and learning and that was huge and I, i'm just so glad that i had that opportunity but like that's not where a lot of us are and a lot of maybe even leaders now who are being expected to speak out and who, who just haven't had that experience like we need to be able to create context where people are able to be together to listen and learn and hang out together and this brings me on to my next thing like i, I want to get a bit more specific now about the church uh, and about open heaven church and again you have full permission to be honest and to, to say things that i don't want to hear and that we don't want to hear but we need to <laughs> <laughs> But you know, <laughs> Renee mentioned earlier about um, being in a, a majority white place, um, that open heaven, in reality, that's what it is. Um, you know, you've, you guys have talked to me separately, you know, off camera about this term microaggressions, which I'm really uh, interested to learn more about and to hear about. Like, I don't know how, how we kind of start this segment, but like, what what's that like for you in terms of being in our church context where you have been you know not the majority but yeah what's been your experience of that and what we'll move on to in the in a minute it's going to be i suppose what do you want your white friends to know especially or your white kind of church friends to know what what can we do as a as a church as well so but start off with like your experiences and you can be yeah just be straight up about them I'll go first, Michael. <laughs> I can tell you you're holding off. Um, I think for me, when I remember when I came in Freshers, and if I'm completely honest, I was like, I looked at OH and I was like, there is, other than I think Hope, Nibiendo, I think, um, I looked around, her shout out, Hope, I looked around and I was like, there is no one here that looks like me. And I had this belief that no one fully understood um me and so I was a part of an amazing fresh year like shout out freshers in my year uh, it was great and it and I loved it and I, and I learned a lot and I loved church but I still had this feeling of like I don't fit I feel uncomfortable and I had I went through a stage where I just felt so lonely and I felt so I just separate and disconnected um and I didn't quite understand why at the time but I think I, I kind of knew it has something to do with being uh, one a minority um, and as I've kind of, I guess, served church more and been a part of the church family, the effect of it is, I guess, less noticeable, but it's still very prominent. Um, and it's, I think oh, it, it's important for me to recognise here that OH is still a really good church for diversity and for inclusion. Um, and I remember talking to somebody earlier today and they were like, that's what separated OH from just other places that they visited, not just in Loughborough, outside Loughborough as well. Um, and it, they made them feel like they had a good sense of community because they could see other people that looked like them. Um, but like, it was something that I struggled with. And in terms of things of how I, for example, how I've grown up um, worshiping was always a struggle. Um, so I've grown up in, a, my grandma's Jamaican. Uh, so I've grown up with my mum and my gran. And my gran is like a worshiper. She, she's a dancer and like a, a mover. And so I came to church kind of wanting to do that. And I've, there's been times of this year where I've probably moved a bit more. And I've had comments, just a couple comments of just like, oh, that was, you know, energetic worship or little things like that. And it seems like not a big deal, but it, if it's something that I'm considering in the moment, I'm like, I don't really want to mm. full, go full out worship and someone calls you out on being energetic. It is difficult. Mm. Um, it's, it's really difficult. Or there's a sense of like, uh, um, the lead like yourself, Joe, and every, all the other leaders and people in OH have um, like empowered me to, to kind of use my communication gifting. But then at the same time, some people within the church unconsciously um, mention the way I say things. So sometimes they may be like, oh, you say ask and not ox. And it's little things like that. And it's like communication is a gift thing that I want to use. But at the same time, people are challenging the way that I speak. And so then it's like a, a weird, um, it's a weird relationship, really. And it makes it, it, makes it quite challenging. Thank you for sharing that michael you carry on and i'll kind of reflect back in a minute yeah um um so i guess personally there's like probably that one instance i guess that stands out um 
Um, so we were at a Christian place uh, praying. Um, there was there was like a group of like maybe like ten fifteen of us um, praying for a few people, um, and yeah, no, everybody was just like it, it wasn't it wasn't like prayer. One just like okay, prayed in someone else's space, somebody else's space, and like for me, um, sorry, um, like some sometimes when I pray like I may talk a little bit faster when I feel like God's doing something my voice may get a little bit louder it's not intimidating it's not aggressive it's not trying to overpower anyone it's just an, a, like a natural thing that my my expression of like when I pray sometimes does mean I, I talk a bit faster it does mean I talk a bit louder but that's like that's just that's just like the just that's when I just feel like God's doing something um, so I remember like praying and um after uh, after we finished i remember someone putting me to the side and being like um michael's going to say like I, I, I felt like god was saying you need to learn how to be more gentle and that comment like <laughs> even yeah um e- even like to now just i, th- I think it's just hard because they, they they probably really didn't see it as like like a like a race thing but to say something like that like really really hurt and i, I think i just responded saying like oh thanks let me know but like deep down i was like i was angry i was so angry i was it because that that wasn't someone telling me like no at first is saying that like, god said this that's a whole nother whatever but like I'm, 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 I'm sure God enjoyed my my talk a bit louder, talk a bit faster. Peg. I'm sure he saw that I was moving aside. So I'm sure he was gassed. So mm. I'm pretty sure God didn't say that. Be gentle, anyway. But just to hear something like that was just. I felt like it wasn't only like insulting me, but just insulting like my people. And now it's like imagine if my my mum came to pray for someone, for example. Then people tell my mum to. I'm like, I'm like but you, you like you, you don't. Like my mom, my mom is so gentle, but if if she's praying, mom's a prayer warrior, man. And if she wants mm. to talk fast and talk louder, let her talk fast and talk louder. Yeah, like who, exactly, like who are you to try and say you're? And it goes back to the whole stereotype of oh, black people are aggressive, are oh, black people really loud, are oh, black people really intimidating. And it just brought me back to I remember in first year, I remember when James Ladrin came to do mm. um, the first weekend away. And I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I thought his message, I never get him saying, pray until, and even until it comes, keep praying and say thank you, just pray until. And, um, but I remember so many times speaking to so many people being like, oh, it's comments like, oh, he's quite intense. Oh, he's quite aggressive. Oh, would he not just calm down? Oh, would he, uh, and like, when, when, when you speak to him, he's, he's so, he's so chill. He's so mm. chill. But if, if, if my guy is talking about something that's so passionate to him, and something that means so much to him. He's like he if he if he expresses that from by walking up and down from talking fast, I like, let him do that. Like don't don't say that oh he's too much or he's quite intimidating. Or I understand what I'm saying you're used to, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. And I think that's just for me saying that's really hard that when that happens, because it just and even explaining that to certain people, I explained that to some some of my white friends and they saw it as just like another like someone says something that's not very kind to you. Um and they were like, oh, just don't let certain people speak, and speak into your life. And are oh, just in life, people say things to wrong and make you feel bad, but just ignore that. And it's like, well, it's because they didn't understand that it's not just a comment. Like this is, it's a, it's a deeper race thing. And if, 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 if you played how I play, they wouldn't say that to you, Joe. And that's not just because you're actually, but that's because you're white. And that's just the truth. And it's uncomfortable to hear, but it's just the truth. And I think that's just like the hardest thing for me. And like I said, this isn't, everyone I'm not and I'm not saying this one person is whatever but that I know for a lot of my friends who have asked that's certain that like they resonate with in like a lot of their churches um like not just OH but just like around where they feel the sense of oh if I do this will I look aggressive will I look intimidating will I look over the top if I if, if I start moving or start start dancing in worship like that's where people feel they have to like rein themselves in because they don't look like oh it's me it's me it's me actually mm. that's just how they express themselves so if i want to if i want to do a two-step to um kick kick, kick on my heart i'm a two-step if i want to <laughs> you know what i mean so like it's not it's not oh you're really over the top or like no this is just how i'm expressing myself 
So, and if that's how I choose to do that, like, allow me to do that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's just like an example. And just, I think, just a quick point. Like, I was asking some of my friends just from around like di- different churches, just about, um, and just like what their experience in like a white majority church. And like, some of the stuff people said to me was like, um, it's quite even hard to uh, read though. They, some people said about how um, they feel like, people assume it's their responsibility to talk to new black people. So if a new black person comes, no white person is going to talk to them. They feel like, oh, I'm the black person. I have to talk to them because mm-hmm. like nobody else will. Or like people are shocked where you, if you say you, you, grew up, you didn't grow up in a black Pentecostal church or if you grew up in a white Anglican church, they're like, whoa, I thought you would have grown up in a happy, clappy church. Like, mm-hmm. anyway, or like when uh, there was a time where someone said to me about how they had too many, th- the church thought, felt they had too many black people on worship team that day and like set up so they had to like reschedule people off because they didn't want to have too many black people on stage and like people fearing that people find them intimidating or they'll be nice to you and like welcome me in the first week but then give it two months and then we won't talk to anyone and that's not me trying to say that's everyone but it's me trying to say like we have to just we have to just accept that this does happen in the church and i think mm-hmm. it's accepting that and being humble enough to say that look this is a real thing it's not just non-christians who can make little racist comments or do things that like black people find like hard to take it's happens in the church as well so i think mm. just tr- be able to like n- not feel guilt but feel like the the conviction from god that like this isn't how it should be and this isn't how we should act and then like conviction leads to repentance and blah blah blah, blah and yeah I'll stop. Mm. i feel like just drawing yeah. upon some of mike's points there because they're like you just, <laughs> just might drop it. it's all right Sorry. um no it's sick it's sick it's good. um i feel like some of the reasons that I guess Michael has said is why we often see a divide between black and white churches. I think because often, well, initially I think it started because when um, black people came over, I think in my grandparents' generation, they were like actively turned away from um, like the church. Therefore they had to kind of go and make their own uh, churches where they could worship God. Um, And I think, I think those kind of attitudes within church is just it pushes people out and it either pushes them to the fringes or it pushes them to a completely different church or, or even just away from faith because people feel like I can't fully worship God how like I want to worship God yeah. um, and I feel like if we again look at look at OH um, specifically is I think if you look at the people or in particular OH1 um, if you look at the people who are on the fringe of church or kind of just on the on the edge is mm. that often it's a majority um like black people um and i remember somebody making a comment of like to to me of like why why is it that black people often keep themselves to themselves like in the church or um in a, talking about another another uh, christian group in in Loughborough, like why why is it that they're together and at the time i didn't have the words to express it like why or whatever but i think it raises the question of like but at the same time the majority of churches that we're in um are predominantly predominantly white and it's like if as a black person as a minority entering that space it's scary to go up to a, a group of like um white british people in a group as, as a friendship group so you keep yourself to yourself but then you're missing out on on community mm-hmm. and that's obviously one of oh's values i'm yeah pretty sure um Grace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've been trained well. <laughs> um, but like, it's a sense of like, people are just like, I can't, it, people expect the black people on the edge to make, to make the step in. But it's like, I can't make the step in unless I'm welcomed in. Um, mm. And it's just like, uh, and sometimes it's, you often see people at the, at the back or on the sides. And uh, I know that I'll try and make an effort to, to go and speak to them. Or I know Mike, and a few others do but it's like it can't always be us it can't always be yeah. the black people that are clocking the other black people you know it needs to be yeah. a wider a wider thing and I think often it's like uh, sometimes I have to challenge more people to of like oh do you mind just speaking to that person who's black and I don't often have to do that when it's like a, 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 a white newcomer it's just kind of naturally just done and I don't know why that is and I'm not accusing here because and I definitely know that's not the case for everybody um but it's just something I guess I've picked up on and I think Rachel mentioned in the comments this sensational book we need to talk about race <laughs> by Benzel. it is honestly amazing and it is literally about understanding the black experience in white majority churches in the UK so I mean it's basically us really um 
So, yeah. So that's been really helpful. There was, there was loads of books that were shared the other day um, by your friend who was, I've met her at the church Deshaun. church once. She's not open heaven, yeah. is she? She's, she goes yeah, to the church. Deshaun. Deshaun, yeah, yeah, she did an amazing video with loads of books that were like, yeah, well worth checking out. Maybe if you guys share it, and like, yeah, <laughs> well edited, isn't it? Um, that was awesome. Um, well, I, I think like the first thing I want to say in response to that is obviously a huge sorry on behalf of Open Heaven, on behalf of the leadership team of Open Heaven for any ways in which we have facilitated or enabled a culture where you haven't been able to be yourself. Uh, and I find it really saddening to hear that you just haven't been able to be yourself. It, it's you, You're not even talking about like some other levels of it that you could have gone to. It's just the facts of being able to talk how you talk and dance how you dance and read how you read and speak how you speak and pray how you pray. And I'm I'm really sorry that that's been that's happened in our culture and, and we want to do whatever we can to make sure that doesn't happen and that you get to feel that you can fully be yourself and, that, and everybody can f- fully be themselves um, and that we we learn and we listen and we and we make amends and we like you said we we repent um, we receive forgiveness we reconcile and we grow together and um, I, I'm fully aware that we are far from perfect far far from perfect in open heaven and um, it's very easy to point the finger at other people, other churches, other situations, but we have got so much of our own house to get in order. Um, and, we, you know, I mean, we want we want to be a church where people are fully welcome to be themselves. And, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry that hasn't been your full experience and not just yours, but guys who are watching and listening, you know, some of our friends that we talked about, some of the guys that you've name dropped, so many who haven't been, if that's been your experience, we're, we're really sorry. Um, and we want to commit to, to walking this together and to listening and learning. And, you know, I think Malachi said in the comments that conversations like this are the beginning of that. It's moving in that direction. It is just the beginning. Um, but there is much for us to learn and grow. Um, I guess we, we, we've got it. I'm looking at the time. I don't really care about the time, but I know that we said roughly a time on it. But, um, you know, I've seen a couple of like pieces going around of like, um, 10 things I wish my white friends knew about race or five things and you know I've read some I've read quite a lot of stuff um, myself but is there some stuff that you, you you've probably you've known some things that really helpfully already are there things particularly for for white people watching this right now and myself who is a white person in case we all forgot um, I feel really lightly <laughs> white with this light on my face and it's lighter than normal yeah no, no it always comes to my skin as well look. <laughs> like an angel um, what like what do what do we need to know from your perspective and like what can we do differently to what how we have done that's been harmful to make sure that this becomes an ongoing change and movement and not just a moment but also that we can not say stupid things or speak in ignorance or do things that are just unhelpful I think before we go on to that I just think as well I just want to I want to thank RH. Um, I think as much as we've noticed things and there's areas that we can improve, the culture of, um, I guess, authenticity and the fact that as as a church family, we can go to the leaders and challenge and question things and we can have these discussions. It is really important, I think, rather than just like it'd be a lot worse if we just couldn't talk and there was a sense of like everything's going on, but we can't say anything. I think that would be a lot worse. I just want to say thank you to to everyone in OH as, as it has been a very um like I've loved I've loved it I love it and um, I think we are one in Christ which is the most important and I think that is shown um through every effort that's been made so far um but yeah that's the question <laughs> more thinker time more thinker time good job good job <laughs> um, I can't um, think and talk at the same time though I <laughs> <laughs> if, I'm filling, if I'm filling, I'm like, oh, I forgot what I was going to say next. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, I think you know, oh, go on, Mike, go, 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 go. No, you go, you go. No, you go, go. you go. Okay, no, I've stopped. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, obviously, we are uh, disciples, most first and foremost, and we're trying to become more like Jesus. And I think in that process, as we do that, um, naturally, we should, uh, there'll be things that we, we change. And I guess this is 
one thing if we have racial biases uh, becoming more like Jesus is deconstructing them um and so I think to do that is is prayer um massively I think prayerful reflection um asking God okay what's what have I got in my heart that isn't of you um in terms of within this topic of race um and just yeah just being really honest with with yourself and with ourselves and just being really true to what's what's going on and taking it before God um and asking him so I think that's probably one thing that we could all do as Christians specifically is is just pray um and also pray for what's going on um yeah there's no words to describe what's happening at the moment but I think just praying that we'll see change um yeah and just praying that God's will be done I think um just a sense of I saw Mike Todd who leads um Transformation Church talking about uh, Revelation 7 9, where it talks about um, every nation, every tongue, every tribe will worship. Yeah. And he was basically saying, like, at the end of the day, that's going to happen. Like, it's, it's fact mm. almost. And he was like, whether it's just a matter of whether we let it happen in our lifetime. Um, so yeah. it's, I guess we can rest in the sense of, like, we don't need to necessarily worry about it because it's going to happen, but we just mm. we want it to happen like now. So I think, yeah, prayer. Um, and yeah, I'll probably think of some what Michael talks. I was going to say praise <laughs> because I remember my so one one of my mates put something on their story which I found um, he put um, he said don't feel convict don't feel guilty for being white feel convicted for being silent guilt is unproductive but conviction leads to repentance repentance leads to recommitment and recommitment leads to transformation and I I found that like so like because it, it's such a hum humbling thing to like repent for something you may not feel directly attached to and you may not feel like really is about you but like in in I think I, I can't remember what verse it was I think I wrote it down in Bible it talks about like praying for the sins of your like four four forefathers like your ancestors like long time ago and as 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 a white person we can well they can pray for repentance about stuff to do with the slave trade stuff to do with colonialism like so like so much and it's not to put the guilt on them but so they they feel convicted and they see god's heart in the situation about how he views it because it's not until that and not until how like i saw a video on facebook about these um these like um white group people praying um there was like they were like need need kneeling down mm-hmm. this massive group and they were like praying for forgiveness and oh, to these few black people and that was that was to me that is like as a church as like Son, son, and son, daughter of the most high. Like, that is that should be our first, like, mm. our first thing we do when we hear stuff like this. It shouldn't be like, obviously, I'm like, do, do, doing the pra- practical stuff's great, but the heart we're doing it from is the most important because, like, it's when your heart starts to change, that's when your action changes. It's not just because you now, because we don't want to have loads of people that just know the right thing to do, but the heart sees, sees nothing because now we're just going to end up with a population that just know about Stephen Lawrence, know that I was talking about friends, know that. I should donate to these charities and sign the petitions, but the heart doesn't change. Um, mm. So I think just like being able to just say, you know what, like God, I humbly, like I humbly just like bow to you. And like, I say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what my ancestors have done. I'm sorry for what is being done right now. But I just pray that God, you just like open my heart to it. And like, I just share your heart on it. And I view, I view people as you see them. Where you say that you, you look at the heart, you don't see like mm. height or appearance. You, you see the heart. Um, so yeah, just like, as Richard said, like get our hearts right first. Um, cause I think from that, from my heart, that's truly like God's heart, then everything will just naturally flow out of that. Um, mm. like, yeah. So yeah. 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 I feel like I just, yeah. Everything that Michael said, ditto. Um, but yeah, I think for prayer, like I said, I think as well, like we spoke about earlier, journeying with people, being there, showing empathy and not sympathy. Um, and I think just I've seen a lot about reading and watching stuff um but I think be careful of just watching something for consumption and watching yeah. something for actual education yeah, this is it. yeah um for sure. and like or just reading because it's it's cool to read and it's 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 trendy so you could you can say you've read it but actually read it and be impacted by it yeah. um there are a ton of, I think, ton of things I, that I could recommend. I said, we need to talk about race in terms of books. Um, there's another one called White Awake, um, which is more focused on the American church. 
um, fiction wise, there's a great book called Small Great Things by Jodie Picoult. Um, but yeah, TV show wise, there's, there's a ton on Netflix. And Michael and I were talking the other day how we both watched there's a TV show called When They See Us. And we just, yeah, just cried, absolutely bored throughout the whole thing. Um, and I think that's because we're impacted by what we see. Um, mm. So don't just, like I said, don't just watch it and like, be like, oh yeah, this is great. But look at, okay, this yeah. is real. This is, this is, yeah. this is happening. Um, yeah. And how can I, how can I change? And as well, I guess diversity is a really important thing, but in the book, he makes a really important point. He says, diversity is not, diversity is about bodies. Inclusion is about cultures. And so we don't want to just, be diverse for the sake of being diverse. We want to create yeah. a culture where everyone can feel at home and everyone yes. can feel loved. Um, yes. And that's, yeah, that's really my take on it. That's so good. Yeah. That is really good. Wow. I was going to say something, but it's gone. But that was awesome. <laughs> 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 um, I thought it would be really great if we prayed to finish. Yeah. Um, mm. There's so much that we could have said so much that we yeah. could have gone into we just we could have been speaking for hours um yeah there's so many people that could have contributed to this and i recognize there'll be people that are not in this conversation that would have loved to have been and might even be watching it thinking why wasn't i in that conversation wish i was it's listen it's, it's impossible to get that right but i just want to thank you both so much so much for your honesty for your vulnerability we've had so many comments that i've not even really got i've not even got through them so i just wanted to be listening to you but People are just so grateful for that, for what you've said, for the honesty you've, you've, you've expressed. And um, yeah, and like you said, we don't want this to just be a conversation this week because of what's happened, but it's an ongoing conversation. I've had a few ideas that I talked to you about off cam, but um, yeah, just really grateful for your time in this. Um, yeah, humbling. We love you guys so much. We love you guys too. We love you you're, too. You're such an important <laughs> part of this community. So, um, shall we pray? I'll, I'll pray first. And um, yeah, you're getting a lot of love in the comments. I don't even have time to read them all, but we'll have a look at them afterwards and go through them. Let's pray. <laughs> yeah, Father, we we are believing for a shift in culture in the name of Jesus. Um, I want to pray that what Renee was saying earlier is, is a prophetic statement that a, a shift has come. Uh, it's not just an is coming. It's not a on the horizon, but right now that a movement has begun that is that is bringing about a kingdom culture. And we ask God that we would never again be the same. And we pray, Father, that this would be a time where we are truly one body and where the scriptures that, that talk of us being one in Christ become our reality. And in the same way that we pray the Lord's Prayer, that um, that your will would be done here as in heaven. We ask God that that prayer in Revelation that, that Renee talked about, that would be now on earth as in heaven. That the beautiful yeah. diversity of every tribe and nation and culture and tongue worshipping as one before Jesus would be our reality on earth. Mm -hmm. We pray, God, that you would empower us as a church to do that, to facilitate that, to make that happen, to live it. Not just to speak about it, but to live it, God. Uh, we pray, Father, with you, with humility. We pray for um, forgiveness in the name of Jesus for where we have let our unconscious biases shape um, the way that we've treated each other. We for, we ask for forgiveness, God, for the way that, um, you know, for us as, as white people, I'm talking for, for me and for people who are white watching this, for the way that we have said or done things that have meant that our friends who are black or from other um, minority ethnicities have felt marginalized or alienated that they've not been able to be themselves. We say sorry Jesus, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us and would you change us, God? More than just wiping that slate clean, would you change us? Would you open our eyes? Would you open our hearts to experience and to story, to history and to what's coming? And we pray, Father, that you would cause unity to come in your church in a way that has not been seen for, for many, many, many years, maybe not ever seen before. We pray, God, that we will be able to stand together as one and that we would love each other for who we are not for who we think we should be um i want to pray your blessing in the name of jesus over renee and over michael uh, over all of the people not just in open heaven but across your church who have found this such a painful time who have felt distanced or marginalized or pushed to the sides we pray god that you would fill them with your peace with your holy spirit that you'd fill them with power that you would uh, empower them to do everything you've called them to do and everything that they've been called to be, that nothing would hold them back, certainly not their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And we just ask for your grace to be poured out on your church at this time. And that this will be a time of deep learning, deep humility. And because of those things, deep transformation, God. And we, we await with great hope the church that you are building out of this. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you that you've made us in your image. Like the first, we've been made um, as your children um, and co-heirs with Christ, God. And that's where our identity, like our identity rests. Um, and we know that our identity as um, children of you, God, it's never, it's never going to change. And even though we may be persecuted in this world, God, that, that is something so special um, and something that is you've just blessed us all with and everyone listening, God. Um, but I also thank you for our differences, God. I thank you for the difference in culture. And I thank you for the, the fact that we, we are different and that we do come from, from different places. And we are, I don't know, white British, black British, Asian British. And there's just such a, a beautiful, um, like diverse picture of, of your church, God. And as we, we all come together and we all bring our different cultures and all bring our different giftings, God, I just pray it's, it's to worship you and to see your kingdom come um, kingdom on earth right now, Jesus. Mm. So mm. I just pray, I just pray that in this time there's peace, um, but also there's conversation, God, and there's a change. And um, I just pray that you're at the center of that, of that change in Jesus name. Yeah. Amen. And um, before the uh, call, cool. I was saying to a German, eh, um, about the verse, First Samuel sixteen, uh, chap, one First Samuel chapter sixteen, verse seven, where it says, "But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart." Um, so yeah. God, I just pray to you right now that you would just help us to see as you see, help us to see men and women as as you see them, God. Um, I pray that you would just yeah, I, 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 I just pray that we will just seek seek your face and seek your heart, God. I just, I just pray that in the midst of all, all that's going on, um, through the sorrow and the hurt and the pain, like a community's feeling right now, I pray that you just really just pour out your your peace that surpasses all of our understanding onto us right now. That even in the midst of the protest, in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the anger, we'll just be overwhelmed with your peace, God. Um, in a situation where the world will say we can't have peace over you, 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 you have a promise that this peace will surpass their understanding, God, and our understanding as well. So God, to show, show yourself worthy in our hearts right now, pour, pour out your peace onto us, God. And I just, I just want to thank you as well for all, 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 all of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are standing up, who are not afraid mm. to be, who are not afraid for people to look at them in a weird way for standing for, up for their, that friend stand up for what's right because God that's exactly what you, you you would do as well but that's exactly what you have done and you continue to do and you will do as well God um, so I just really just want to say thank you to those people thank you because you've given them the boldness you've given them the strength you've given them the courage to um, to, to just, just to speak on behalf of all of us God and I pray you just continue to raise up more bold bold children God who want the faith to stand up against when they see injustice in the world and you continue mm -hmm. to raise up people who's just are just seeking you so much god so it's really i said to start open our eyes to see how you see god um because we want to we don't want to look at men from their physical stature and their appearance we look at their heart um so god i pray that you would just really grant us all of that in in your name i pray amen amen, amen. amen. Oh, man. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was, I was, i mean so shall it be man come on Listen, I want to just read some of the comments because it's harder to look at them after they've gone, but there's some really powerful stuff in here. Um, I'll start from the bottom. Malachi, um, proud to be part of a church that doesn't shy away from these conversations. Big up Michael, Renee and Joe for sharing and discussing in such an articulate way. Nathaniel, thank you so much, Michael and Renee. This has been so eye-opening and inspiring. Really hard to hear this stuff. My heart feels so heavy with shame and regret as a nation, as a church, but I'm praying for forgiveness to be possible and personal deep conviction to make a difference. Um, Nessa's amen the prayers Jamie thanks for sharing Anu super grateful that our church isn't shying away from it you're providing a safe space like Becky Tyres Damola I mean there's just so many just make sure you guys read them at some point because they'll, they'll be super encouraging um, hopefully this is the start of many conversations but we have been here for a while um, yeah we'll leave you guys alone it's, 
it's just started to rain in Loughborough. I'm taking that as a prophetic sign. <laughs> showers of blessing. Yeah. Showers of Shower, blessing. The heavens are open blessing. over us. <laughs> Let it rain. <laughs> Guys, love you so much. Hope you have a, an amazing day. And uh, let's keep going together, hey?